this workshop. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being That's here. Perfect. Can everyone hear me okay? And welcome to the Secret to Equitable Classroom Engagement. Everyone has a voice. So um, one thing that uh, we educator want our graduate to be able to do is to communicate well, right? And to learn to communicate well, in addition to interacting with the course content, students need to interact with one another and with you, the instructor. So studies show that instructional approaches that use student interaction as most likely to enhance student learning, especially in diverse classroom. So I know faculty, myself included, use many instructional approaches to encourage student participation and interaction through discussion, Q&A session, presentation, writing, and problem solving. So today we will explore some evidence-based strategy to support equitable classroom participation and engagement in your field. Um, I will put the present the citation for uh, this presentation in the resources slide at the end of the PowerPoint, and I will send a copy of the PowerPoint today to all the attendees so that you have some um, the slide as well as the reference for the workshop. So welcome to the workshop. My name is Lin Nguyen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I've taught chemistry here at NIU since 2016. Um, and uh, I taught both the undergraduate and graduate level. And then um, this past June, June 2023, I joined the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning as one of the two inclusive teaching coordinator. And although I am very new to the faculty development field, I have over a decade of teaching experience in higher education at various private and public institution. And I'm very excited to have you here with me to discuss um, some of the strategy and practices that we could use to foster um, equitable classroom engagement and communication skill for our students. And so we can help better prepare them for a diverse workplace in the future. So now I want um, you to share with the groups and we're gonna spend the next 60 minutes of our life together. Let's find out how diverse we are in terms of our discipline and expertise. Um, so I did prepare, oops, sorry. I did prepare a poll. I'm gonna deploy the poll. The poll have two question. Um, the first one is, what is your discipline? And the second one is, what do you hope to get out of this workshop? So the multiple way you can participate, you can type into the poll. And um, you only have 250 characters, which I think should be enough for you to type in what are your discipline, you can say English, you can say chemistry, you can say biology. Um, and then I'm going to show the result to everyone after everybody have a chance to participate. Or you can type in the chat. I can show the chat function as well. Or you could unmute and speak. So the three different ways that you could participate in this introduction. I did want everybody to get to know each other a little bit more before we get started. We're gonna talk about um, wait time <laughs> and how wait time could um, increase participation. So I did budget a few minutes for this. So I'm gonna sit here and wait to give you a chance to participate. Yeah. 
yeah Kathy said uh, it's, it can be hard to wait and and tempted to feel in the silent yeah yeah All right, so if you still typing, um, I see four out of nine participant, um, four out of nine people here participated. Let's see, I did project two minutes, so I'm gonna have to end the poll now and show the result with everyone. To see not good all right okay so i don't know if you can see my screen with the result kathy can you see it yep i see it oh great okay so english political science strategic management nursing so we have a pretty diverse group here that's great um what do you hope to get out of the workshop? Are we looking for new strategy and better practice practices to serve student best? Excellent. Some best practices around engaging our NIU undergraduate student in the classroom. Class activity, discussion, group work. Excellent. Um, I want to know if um, in effortly leaving out or overlook anyone in my class, particular doing class discussion, be more equitable. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, poll survey. Yeah, um, no worry for those who come in late. This is great. Um, I am very happy and grateful to see that you are so um, you care about a student, right? And you want to improve your teaching and you want to to reevaluate the way that you're doing things. So thank you for that. We'll stop sharing. I'm gonna get back to the screen. I can see more people here. That's exciting. Okay. All right. Now I'm gonna share my presentation again. Nope. You do not see my presentation. Okay, sorry about that, I'm back now. So um, <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's dive in and see how we can help our student engage and participate more in your classroom, in your discipline. So um, you all know, if you teach in a classroom, you know that a truly balanced class engagement strategy will promote equity and inclusion and uh, by am am amplifying the voices of all students rather than just a few outspoken one. Um, so of course that doesn't happen by chance. It takes intention and preparation to cultivate equitable and inclusive interaction and promote active learning, which is the best way to learn, as we all know, based on ample of uh, research evidence out there. So the goal for this workshop is for you to be able to do um, these following thing. Develop norms or guidelines for participation. Um, construct equitable way to call on to student. Nurture voices that challenge the dominant narrative. And the last one is equitable assess student participation. And the fact is, are we gonna grade student participation or should we not grade student participation? It's still an ongoing conversation that, uh, that we should have among um, educators. Oops. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. How do I do this? Thank you, Kathy, for telling me that. Okay, we appreciate that.
How about now? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. It's kind of throw me off a little bit, <laughs> but thank you so much. So um, the last, let's move on. I uh, need the few seconds to re readjust here. Okay. All right. So do you still see? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I hope you still see my presentation and not my note view. Um, if, if you see anything else, please let me know. So the first learning objective is develop norms for participation. Um, so one thing that I hope you would consider is uh, co-create or co-generate the norm, the guideline for class participation with your student. So this allows students to take part in establishing the type of participation they wish to have in your classroom. And it's also make it easier for you to reinforce the norm because when something happens, you can just say, ah, we agree at the beginning of the semester, you agree to it. And so when you have some norm for class participation, um, it's easier for you to remind students that they created and agree to these classroom, pol classroom policy. Um, so, um, so that's something um, to, to consider, right? And depend on what courses you teach, what considered norm can be relatively different. For example, if you're teaching a discussion-based, um, say social justice education course, you might want to consider challenge some of the common guidelines for discussion norm. Um, why? Because many of the common or traditional guideline is reinforce the unequal power dynamic in, in higher education and in our society. But um, that's gonna be for another workshop. Um, for this one, I'm gonna show you a few basic norms that I use in my introductory level general chemistry course. So it's a hard science. We don't discuss or learn about opinion, right? The content in the chemistry course uh, that I taught is driven by evidence-based knowledge. So one of the norms I work very hard to establish in my classroom is to normalize being wrong. I keep telling students it's okay to make mistake. Is it normal to make mistake? That's how we learn. And um, and at the beginning of class of each class, after I introduce the learning objective for the day, I often ask questions to evaluate student prior knowledge uh, of the learning objective for that day. And if they gave me a wrong response, we actually have a little celebration. I would say something like, excellent, we are going to learn something new today together. And uh, sometimes I even go as far as say that if you already know all the answer to these questions, you probably shouldn't be in this class. You should be in the upper division class. So uh, celebrating and normalizing, making mistakes really help my students to feel comfortable and, and um, more likely to participate when I ask them question. Um, so the second thing I have is acknowledge and appreciate the effort of those who are participating. So um, I usually, when um, somebody brave enough to raise their hands to ask for clarification or ask for, uh, more example on a complex topic like structure of an atom. Um, I always acknowledge and thank them for the, having the courage to ask the question. And I say that um, this help, I'm sure many other students sitting here have the same question, but because you have the courage to ask it, now everybody gonna be beneficial from more clarification, more explanation, more example. So I really like empower the student who raise their hand and ask question. And I think that also help um, create the supportive environment that encourage other students to, to ask question as well. 
Um, the last one I have here is uh, establish expectation for being on time using technology and holding um, side conversation. So I taught large enrollment classes up to 200 students per section. And so it critical for me as an instructor to establish expectation for being on time using technology or holding side conversation at the beginning of the semester. So these are only a few things and it worked well for large enrollment introductory chemistry course. So um, I put it out there because it worked for me, right? So different classroom, you might have different norm that you want to consider and that's yes <laughs> and that's what the next slide gonna be because I want you to share with the whole group um, I'm gonna leave the screen on for just a minute and then I'm gonna uh, stop sharing so that we can have a discussion but I do want to hear from the participants because you come from diverse um discipline, what are some basic norms that you use in your class? And how does that work out for you? At the same time, I also want you to think about, um, do your classroom norm challenge the dominant narrative? And the second question is more like for later. I did put it out here right now, but don't, don't um, if you're not ready to answer the second question, don't worry about it because we're gonna visit it later. Um, doing reflection. So now I just want you to think about some of the basic norm that you use in your class. Did you co-create it with the student or did you just um, present it to them and, and have them own acknowledge that this is what you're gonna uphold in your classroom. So I'll stop sharing my screen, All right? Now is the wait time, so i wait. You could unmute yourself and share with the whole group some of the norms for class participation that you use, or you could unmute yourself and share. And if you have not developed any norm, go, please do share too. Yes, please. Um, hi, so uh, one of the norms that I've had um, is, you know, obviously being in class on time. And this semester, I've noticed, uh, I actually noticed a lot of students just coming in late, um, you know, five minutes late, 10 minutes late, no explanation, um, nothing. So, you know, I I, I told them uh, after a couple, a couple, I saw this happen a couple of times, I told them, you know, I this is my norm. And they were still coming in late. So at that point, I said, uh, well, I'm going to start taking points off for attendance, you know, instead of a one point, if you're late for class, you'll get just a half point. Um, and they did start to follow that uh, once that happened. But one thing that I have struggled with is the side conversation bit, because, um, you know, again, I told them, uh, you know, I'd rather not have side conversations because, it distracts me a lot when I'm in, it sort of interrupts what I'm thinking, right? So, uh, but I, I, I'd, I'd be interested to see if anyone has dealt with that and, and how they manage to um, sort of get rid of the side conversations, but, or if anyone has, has any issues with that. I see. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Stephanie, uh, Dr. Stephanie, you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have to say, I, I agree, side conversations are very distracting. Um, I actually, I've listened to a couple of webinars over the last probably six months. And um, also with the AQ micro-credential training, really talking about this, creating norms with the students at the beginning of the semester. And I have never done that, but from everything I've learned over the last, like I said, six months, um, I do want to do that for the spring um, because as a nursing professor, I mean, we talk about, you know, health, we talk about health behaviors and um, actually today I'm lecturing on substance use disorder and things that are, you know, sometimes heated topics. Um, so the big thing is I just talk to the students about being respectful, respectful to me, I'm respectful for you, you know, to you. Um, but I do see from what I've experienced having a set of norms that we agree upon as a class. And then I can refer back to that norm as we did agree upon this. Please be respectful. Please stop the side conversations. I can see the benefit and I'm going to definitely try it in the spring. Thank you for sharing that. And I think some people even go a step further. They create a 
code of conduct. So if you really struggle with side conversation in your class, you might want to emphasize it in a code of conduct and have each of your students sign it. And so they will honor that. Um, they're more likely to honor that. And when they don't, you can remind them and send them, hey, you signed this code of conduct at the beginning of the semester. So that's another thing that you might want to consider. Um, all right, I'm gonna read what, um, Ari, I'm sorry, how do you say your name? Uh, it's okay, Ari, I can, I can read it too. I just thought oh, you sure, wanted to. Sure, sure, Ari, started. go for it. Well, I was just, I think I was just reflecting on, I teach a lot of 300 level courses in political science that are capped at 40 or often 42. So we end up with kind of 30 people in the classroom regularly, I'd say. Um, and I found it's worked pretty well to do like three different ways of incentivizing or like facilitating active participation that works for different students. So like my, I tend to lecture in a kind of discussion based, almost asking like rhetorical questions as we go that some, but not all students are engaged with and respond to, but then, um, very often, like almost once a week, I do kind of like a half hour group activity where I get into mm -hmm. groups of five to eight or so students and give them a prompt and they work for like 10 or 15 minutes together thinking about things and I move around the classroom and then I find like everybody will talk, you know, to a reasonable standard there. And then they, one or two people from the group will share their thoughts and we'll kind of return to a class discussion or lecture after that. And then I've also done some like think pair share where just like write something down, think for a minute or two and then turn to the person beside you and explain what you came up with. And everyone is okay at that too. And I feel like across those three ways of engaging people, most people in the class actually end up who are showing up, participate, score well, and I think participate in a way that gives value to them as well. So that was, that was my thinking. Ah, I'm so glad that you share that because um, it's, some of the thing that I will recommend later based on um, uh, various and extensive research study to show that how when you break student to small group activity or small group discussion, it encourage more student, particularly women in STEM or other minority identities. So thank you so much for already doing it and sharing it here. Um, yes, Marisa. Thank you. So I'm teaching online, um, and so this is my first semester teaching online, and that has been an interesting, um, yeah, struggle to 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 consider how participation is going to be um, documented in the classroom and how I was going to set up those standards. I did not. Sorry, I'm not getting feedback, so I'm having a hard time talking. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just adjust my um my microphone here and see if that helps. Okay. We hear you just fine. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Okay, hopefully that that is okay. Um so yeah, I created standards. I went back and forth about whether or not to require videos on, and I'm in a class that is primarily discussion-based, and because of that, I decided to require that mm -hmm. um, for the participation, and yet, it's really difficult to manage that, and, and as I'm, you know, <laughs> trying to teach to see, does everybody have their cameras on? Do they, you know, do they have it on for all of the class or part of the class? And so that's something, if anyone has any tips, tricks, thoughts about, um, I would love to hear how other people are managing in, in that online environment. As far as what has been manageable, doing a lot of what Ari, said trying to provide different ways that students participate so you know allowing you know typing in the chat versus actually having their uh, microphones on and speaking or doing um, polls or different you know ways to ask questions where they can respond in different ways and then doing those small groups yeah Marie said what do you teach I'm, I'm teaching social change leadership right now I see. And how large is your online class? To 25. 25. It's a small group. Mm -hmm. So do you use um tool for polling? Do you use something like Mentimeter with word 
uh, grab where they respond? So do you, what tool do you use? Yeah, so I am teaching in teams. Okay. Um, and there's a polling function in there. And so they can see right on the screen the question. And then, so some of them have been like word clouds where they've been able to see, you know, those responses in that or just a results of our strongly agree or disagree. That's I see. Thing. I see. So, um, so I probably we refer <laughs> to you some other resources mm -hmm. that Saito offer and, um, Devaki uh, mentioned Yellow Dick, which is a really good tool for discussion-based um, co classes. Um, so we have, I believe, Saito offer a, a workshop on that or some um, resources. So I would send it to you, Mar Marisa, so you can look into it. But mm -hmm. online um, engagement is, is a different <laughs> kind of beast. It's very challenging. Cassie, do you want to say something? <laughs> I teach at kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. So this semester I have an English 103P, which is for freshman writing students that are presumed to need extra support based on the history that they're bringing into the classroom. And then I teach a 400 professional writing course that's synchronously online. So I, I feel you on that. My participation goals and approaches are completely different in those two settings. So really in the English 103P, I, I approach it almost like I think maybe a homeroom teacher in high school would, because a lot of the task there is to help students learn how to go to college, which is something that a lot of them have no idea how to do, um, especially since this is the first time they've been in a situation where nobody there's no immediate consequence if they don't show up, you know, hand something in on time. There's nobody hunting you down. There's nobody calling home. There's nobody leaving messages for your parents, that kind of thing. So we spend a lot of time just talking about how to be successful in college, which obviously extends beyond my classroom. At the other end, um, in the asynchronous online courses where I mostly have professional students that are taking professionally oriented writing courses like like um, technical editing or I'm teaching digital writing this term. I don't require that they have their cameras on. I never do that. Um, I think that's especially important for students who are living on campus if they are, because you know I don't invite them into my bedroom. And really for those students, we're asking them sometimes to turn the camera on in, in what amounts to their bedroom. So mm -hmm. I never ask them to do that. But I do ask them to at least have a mic that works. And then I've moved towards a lot of scenario teaching. So I'm teaching about social networking right now. And I gave them scenarios like here's the organizations or the or the business that you're going to run the social networking for small groups brainstorm for all of these very different places from a community service organization to a landscaping service. What would your approach be? They do amazing at that. Or I do things like have them create the rubric for whatever we're working on. They have so much more investment in the rubric when they make it. And they are so much harder than I would be, I think, on the rubric. So that's a, that's a very effective way to do it too. Plus it's important for them to learn how to set their own standards because we're not gonna be able to follow them around for the rest of their lives creating mm -hmm. the rubric for them. So it's good for them to have a situation and know and be able to discern from the situation what the standards would be. I'm assuming that's gonna be, be true in a lot of upper division courses. I have used Yellow Dig too. I took the Yellow Dig certification course. I think there's, there's good and bad things about it. I really want them to own it. I don't want to run that. Mm -hmm. So the good thing about it is that it's student-based. I'll offer them suggestions about ways to support each other there. They can ask each other questions, fill each other in. And then I just kind of swoop in from time to time to see how it's going. But my biggest recommendation there would be to let them own it and don't try to take it over. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. I think you use it like perfectly 
um, as the way it intended to be. It create the space for um, student to create student to student interaction. So yellow dick is not for instructor to interact with student, but it's more for student to student um, interaction, which is something that in the asynchronous online or in online courses, it's, it's really hard to cultivate for students to interact with each other. So everything that was said were wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm gonna get us back to the presentation because I have a few more um, points that I want to bring to your attention. But uh, from your mm -hmm. teaching experience, this is amazing. I'm learning from you. Thank you for sharing. So I'm gonna get us back. So one of the things that I mentioned is um, equitable uh, class engagement, right? So um, do you see student, have you considered student racial and gender identity and how that can influence and to what extent it influence the way student with diverse identity participate in your class? Um, so one of the, Thing that I, I want um, you to consider is some strategy um, that you might already consider, um, or if you have not, then maybe think a little bit about how we can help creating um, successful small group discussion for equitable student participation. So one way is to invite students to think about the way they tend to participate or talk during class discussion or class activity and ask them to make a conscious effort to be mindful of others. So invite them to think about if they are individual who usually talk, maybe take a step back and listen. Um, Ask them to be aware of how gender, cultural background, social economic status, and life experience could affect their participation as well as their classmate participation. And um, I know a lot of people, a lot of places emphasize on making um, sure that students assume the best intent, like people doing their best. But at the same time, I want to challenge that common or traditional thinking. I think we should encourage students to assume their classmates are doing their best and have the best intention. But at the same time, we must acknowledge the negative impact, whether it's were intended or not, but it can be negative impact um, of individual word or behavior, and it can affect um, other student participation, and we should address their behavior as they arise. So these are just something I want us to consider, uh, the difference between think and talk, differences between equal versus equitable, and then um, assume good intent, but acknowledge the negative impact and, and correct that when it's happen. Um, so moving on to learning objective number two, construct equitable ways to call on student. Is it essential to manage who is speaking when and who is taking turn in your classroom? We don't want the few loudest or most confident voices to continue to choose when they speak and inadvertently silent the quiet voices. At the same time, we need to be mindful and not silent the one who are engaged and passionate about certain topic, right? So that's a very difficult line to draw. Um, and we're gonna have to make that decision daily if, every time we teach. So what do you consider when you're constructing practical and equitable ways to call on student? Um, do you call calls? I, I teach large enrollment class, so I often have to use cold calling, like basically randomly call on student. Um, what I learned is it's, it can be an effective way to encourage participation from less vocal student. It can also be a way to bring students who otherwise wouldn't volunteer into the discussion, but that's something that uh, we have to be transparent for example, at the beginning of the semester, I warned my student, 
in my large classroom that I would do cold calling. So everybody need to pay attention and be prepared um, because at any moment, anyone could be called on and put on the spot. Um, so I'm very intentional about making sure that I call on people in equitable way as well. And um, that means I am prepared to deal with the awkward silence, the wait time. <laughs> I typically wait for up to a minute um, after asking the question. And I think it's one of the simplest teaching strategy that I learned is to increase time for students to think and to expand um, the number of students uh, that would participating verbally in, in my chemistry course. Um, so when I lengthen the wait time after posing the question, um, I think it allows students to process and, and perhaps allow the more introvert student time to, to muster the, the courage that they need to raise their hand and answer the question. A lot of it's also based on experience. I am a first generation immigrant, a first generation college um, graduate. So I am very self-conscious about my accent. I know the answer, but I'm not gonna raise my hand because I'm afraid I might speak it in a weird way or people make fun of my accent. I'm also an introvert. So I find out when faculty member give time, give wait time and nobody else raised their hand, I might just go ahead because I know I got the answer. So um, one way that I could extend the wait time is I count like 1001, 1002, 1003, and just like drag it on and somebody will raise their hand and answer the question. And then sometimes wait time is still not enough. And that's when I, um, I ask students to, to write down. So I call it write time. So if wait time is not enough for some student to gather a thought, and muster the confidence to share that thought, then they need some uh, scaffolding, right? Um, I can give mm -hmm. them more instruction and guidance, and I, I can ask them to write down one or two ideas that would capture their initial thought on how to answer the question. So this the act of writing may even lead to student discover point of confusion or key insight. And, and then if you collect this writing, it can hold student accountable in their way of thinking and recording their ideas. Um, yeah, Kathy say that uh, how many of us who teach are introvert? Yep, yep, but we're doing it every day. Introvert by nature, but by training, we can be extroverted too. So um, wait time, right time, and then um, Ari, talk about think, pair, share. It's another excellent way um, to, mm -hmm. to help student participation because um, it provides individual student time to, um, let's see, it's, it's uh, provide student time to verbalize that thought in a safer environment because it's smaller, it would just the uh, classmate who's sitting next to them or behind them, right? So um, think pair share is uh, one of the opportunities, especially for large classroom. I love it when I tell them to turn to your neighbor and talk about something as opposed, like the class becomes so loud, everybody is talking and um, it's, it's very exciting for me to see that. So um, promoting Peer share is another way that you might want to consider to promote collaborative um, in your um, in your classes and more participation in your classes as well. Um, so all of these increasing wait time, allowing right time, utilizing think pair share can also be helpful in ensuring that you have an equitable distribution of um, calling on student participation across gender and racial identity. Um, so for example, if there are three male hand up, I sometimes wait until the woman hand to go up and then I call on her. 
or I try not to call all only the white student because they are more confident. Um, so when we use a variety of ways to encourage student participation, we ensure that the class has an equitable way for every voices to be heard. Um, the next thing I'm gonna ask is for you to share, how do you call on your student? So um, do you have diverse student in your class? Um, do you have a great teaching moments that you had in your classroom? Like when you call on some student and it turned into one of the greatest conversation or if you have an awkward moment in your classroom where an interaction or a question turn into awkward silence. Do you use call, cold calling? Let's try that first. I'm gonna launch this poll. So this poll just have, do you use cold calls. Okay. I know cold calls have a bad rep, but with um, preparation and with the norms that you create in the early um, early at the beginning of the semester, and particularly if you have earned the student trust um, based on multiple things that you prevent, uh, present to them early in the semester, cold calls can, can work out well, especially for large enrollment classes. Okay, so let me share this result with you. So um, most people don't use it, 50% don't use uh, cold calls. But then there's 33% of us here use others. I would like for the people who use others to please share what are your other methods that you uh, call on students. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you should, you should talk about what you said there. That was good. Yeah, I'll just, I, I put other because I use, I do use cold calling, but like after a few weeks or so mm. in in-person classes when I've, again, my classes are smaller, so this might not work as well in a 200 person lecture, but with 30 or 40 people in the room, after a few weeks in, I know the students who I feel like are comfortable and confident enough to engage. Um, and then I feel like we've kind of built up a bit of a rapport that I can say, you know, no one wants to answer that, but there's no wrong questions. How about, I don't know. Samir, you give us your thoughts because you look like you're furrowing your brow at the question kind of thing. And he gives a chuckle and says something. But I would only do that to students I like already feel are confident and comfortable ha doing that, which takes a bit of time to build up a kind of like relationship and, and demeanor in the class. Yeah. That's, I also, that's cool. I'll also just my second point was sometimes I talk to students who say that they're uncomfortable chatting in class, you know. So I say, you know, like it looked like you wanted to say something, but you didn't raise your hand. Like, would you be comfortable if I did call on you? And a couple of times, some people, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, you know, if you, you know, you can do that. And a couple of times they say like, no, that would really freak me out. So I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't if they said don't, but if they've said like, yeah, you know, I might need that kind of push to do yeah. that. You know, if they've yeah. said it explicitly, I would definitely do it. <laughs> Which I have. That. See, that's so interesting because I think I probably do a very similar thing. My classes tend to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or less, you know, depending on uh, what level it's at. I guess I don't think of it as cold anymore if the relationship is already warm. So then I, I put no for that. And then we are aware, I agree with you, we're aware of, of which students are good with that and which ones might be uncomfortable. But then in those small classes too, they do a lot of small group things. So everybody's participating at some point. Yeah, yeah. So uh, all of those are a great thing, right? I see in the chat that you, uh, some, um, Disha, can you please teach me how to say your first name? Uh, if I mean, if you can unmute and teach me, if not. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. Hi. Hello. 
Yeah, my name is Diksha. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And you uh, get chemistry um, TA, so yeah. you you so go near them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Tell so, us. So basically, I just go near them. I'm just asking them like whether they need some help or not. So uh, for me, I mean, it's not like needed to ask. I mean, like call their name. So yeah. I see. Um, they have to be actively participate in the learning in your lab anyway, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's, that's why. Good. That's why it's like we have just like uh twelve students, like in the lab in one lab, twelve mm-hmm. to eighteen students, mm-hmm. because there are some students who are who has been like dropped from the mm-hmm. course. Mm-hmm. So I can treat them individually. Yeah, so that's yeah. why. I, yeah, uh-huh. anybody use uh right time, wait time. I know uh Ari use think pair share. Uh, sorry. So one of the other the other way that we could um encourage student to answer question like if you have mm-hmm. a pre lab lecture and you ask student or if there's a question that require discussion do you uh-huh. have them like think pair share like think in group of two with the lab partner and then share with yeah. everyone yeah sometimes I do just with lab partners only because yeah. I'm just like basically only those two students are not getting that point in I that see. case yes i'm like questioning them regarding that topic and then sometimes they do sometimes they, they don't yeah. answer the question yeah and we don't yeah. have like uh, we have pre lecture before mm-hmm. lab uh but that's like we just like explain them mm-hmm. and we ha- we have to go to procedure as well so it's mm. basically like practical only. So we are more yeah. focused on practical rather than like theoretical knowledge. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh huh. No problem. Thank you for well, Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay. So I bring us back to um. This I realize some of you are gonna have to leave soon. So um, learning objective number three. I want to encourage everybody here to um, nurture voices that challenge the dominant narrative. And so what do I mean by that, right? I I want to encourage you to pay attention to this question of who voices are we hearing and who voices aren't we hearing? And if I think that there are voices that we haven't heard from or perspective that we haven't heard from, then I would usually prioritize making more time to allow space for those voices and those perspectives. So with that said, I encourage you to cultivate brave spaces in your classroom instead of safe spaces. And that switch of mindsets of being brave rather than being safe will allow students to reflect on their identity and how those identity converge or conflict with the course content, especially if you're teaching a discussion, discussion-based course um, where there's a lot of difficult topics that need to be discussed and debate. Um, so the way we look at seeing the experience we have, the different identity that we carry, um, it's, it shaped us into who we are, an educator, lifelong learner, and who we are influences the way we see our student, especially the one who are different from us, right? It's um, who we are affect the way we teach, affect the way we motivate and encourage our student to participate and ultimately to learn. I have students who share with me that um, when she speak or participate in her class, it usually view as she being disruptive. Um, and that's not not good. Um, it's hurt her learning. Um, Kathy say, in my FY writing course, everyone is marginalized in some way. Um, okay. What is your, what is FY? And Kathy, you want to elaborate oh, um, on that? Yes, yeah, so it's first year writing, and okay. I'm teaching the English 103P, two sections of that this term. I'm, I think I'm going to do two sections of it next term, too. 
And just by virtue of being in that course, students are already marginalized. Often they're coming out of underprepared mm. or underfunded schools. Many of them are first generation. Many of them are students of color. Increasingly, many of them are talking about their neurodivergence, their mm. struggles with mental health, um, coming out as being um, gender fluid right. or bisexual, homosexual. It, it's it's good because it's a very comfortable class and students are comfortable talking about those things. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm also aware because they tell me that there's a lot of courses where they don't feel like they can share their identities that way. I think the fact that they're all marginalized in some way helps all of them open up to each other. So in that way, I'm fortunate. Yeah, but well, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's also probably because you create such an, um, a safe and brave space for them to share all of these things that otherwise in other spaces they would hide. So thank you for sharing and thank you for doing that for us, Stephen. Um, so some other uh, thing that I put here, some other practices that I put here that would elevate historically marginalized voices um, are, uh, something that you guys are already doing. Um, one of the thing is know your student individually. Even if you have 12 students and you know them, um, if you can get to know them by name, um, I think when you know your student individually, if you can't, if you have a small classroom, um, you can best meet their participation need. Um, consider instead of penalizing student who disengage during class, maybe talk to them outside of class and find out what's going on, um, what preventing them from participating in class or just that day, that week, or what's going on um, um, in the life in general. Yeah. Um, and then to get students comfortable speaking in larger groups, you might consider to start the conversation in smaller groups first to provide a safe environment for students to gain comfort and confidence. Um, just like what Ari shared, that, that um, you use smaller group in your class um, and it's get everybody to participate. So um, small group discussion and small group activity can encourage the quieter student to become more involved and multiple voices may be empowered um, at the same time, right? Um, you should be clear about the outcomes you expected from small group work. Tell them, tell the student upfront what you expect them um, to do within their group and, and whether you will pick up from there, when you bring the conversation back together, which you may or may not need to do in your class. So those, um, and then um, I have here, how do you nurture diverse voices in your class? And I think Kathy always share about um, how you have most or all of your students is marginalized in some way. Um, I just recently attended a trans ally training and I was told that, um, so the Center for Women and Gender and Sexuality Center, they, I'm sorry, I probably say the, the name wrong, but they, they keep track of our NIE student and students share that they are afraid to, um, to be assigned to, to group. Um, they like to hide themselves in large enrollment classes so that they can be invisible. And that's just, uh, it's pain me to know that. And so uh, I did want to share that fact with you. So as we move forward, maybe thinking about different way we could do to nurture and empower diverse voices in our classroom. We running low on time, so I was, skip this and move to the next one. Um, do you grade student participation? And if you do, how do you equitably assess student participation? And um, uh, let's I'm gonna stop here to see if anybody want to discuss or share. Do you grade your student participation or do you not? And what are the things that you consider if you do grade the particip 
participation. Ari, do you agree participation? Yeah, I do in my in-person classes. Um, generally, I think it rate, like my expectations are pretty low. <laughs> so I like even say like I'm any participation is good participation, asking a question, saying you didn't understand something, saying you didn't like something, <laughs> you know, all that counts as participation. So generally like I keep attendance um, and I'm very, I don't know, generous with how I, I see. go about assessing participation. Yeah. I also tend to give students a check up halfway through the class I see. and say, this is what your, the perspective score would be. It's not the final score. And I tend to wait the latter half of the class or so much more than the first once we're kind of comfortable together. Yeah. So that gives people a opportunity to come yeah. approve or chat or yeah. can, no one's ever contested it, but they could if they wanted and say, you know, I think I do more, et cetera. Yeah. And um, grading. So thank you for sharing that. And also uh, Devaki uh, say that the, she allows students to participate in class or post on discussion board. So that's another excellent way that you can encourage more participation. And um, I mean, for different discipline, different class, these are the things that you have to consider for your, your classes. Because um, if you teach seminar class or discuss and bake class, then, then it feel like grading participation is a necessity, right? Um, it's just when you do grade, um, I, I hope you consider aligning the, your assessment of participation with the learning objective when you can. Um, this involves assessing whether the student acquire the course objective rather than the student compliant. Um, and be, be intentional about your grading. Tell students why you want them to engage and participate and how actively engage with the course material and with one another uh, through class participation will help them acquire and retain the knowledge um, necessary for their career. So those are the few things um, to consider. This is just reflection. Um, I hope you um, think about these um, suggested practices, evidence-based uh, suggested. I want you to reflect on uh, what you've seen and heard here today. What are some changes you would like to make with your class um, participation practices of policy? Um, and I have a list of additional resources that I used to build this presentation. I will send that in the follow-up email to everyone. And I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I think I learned as much from you. I hope you learned something from this um, workshop as well. And uh, you're welcome. We only have a couple minutes, but I'm gonna stop right here. And if anyone want to share their, their thoughts, and reflection on this, you have about two minutes. Ari, you doing amazing thing for your student and thank you for being here and sharing all the practices with us. Thanks for this and thanks everyone for participating. Bye. Bye. Thank you again, Lynn. It was uh, great to be in a session with you again. I always take away wonderful things. So now I'm headed off to my office hours with renewed energy. Thank you, Cassie. It's good to see you here in the Spay. Have a great day. You too. Bye.